Hey there, Envoys of Balance. Welcome to our very first flashlight, where we take a deep dive into different tabletop game systems. I'm Production Master Riley. And I'm Dungeon Inspector Jake. This week, we're learning about the world-building tabletop game, Microscope. Let's roll initiative. Cool, so this week we're looking at, at, at the game Microscope, and the way it works is more or less, we come up with a big picture for history, and then we drill down to periods within that history, events within those periods, and then scenes within those events. Uh, so it's, in, in a sense, it's like kind of a, like a, a fractal way of thinking about history, where each uh, event contains within it a scene, and each period contains within it an event, and so on. And I'm really excited to work on this. Uh, I love the idea you've come up with, thinking about how the written word would spread through a fantasy world. Uh, and so the, the first step that we're going to have to go with when we're building our history is, is bookending it, right? And so what we need to do is describe how the story, how the kind of epic sweep of history in this world is going to start and how it's going to end. So um, I, I, okay. I love this idea. Um, of, I've got to start. What's oh. your start going to be? Okay, so... Um, there's ancient monks, magical people, and they pass down their magic through, uh, oral tradition. Okay. Until somebody figures out, um, how to write down words. Okay. And they, so what's like, hmm, how to write down words. But anyway, so the idea is they... Uh, make like the very first book of magic incantations. Okay, and this is just kind of written out longhand. <laughs> written out longhand, and they begin to teach it within their monastery. Okay, and I love the, this. That's the beginning. Of I it. love that as a yeah. beginning. Yeah. Cool. So I'm imagining when you say that a world where there's like illuminated manuscripts almost and magic is being done, you know, through these kind of hard to produce, very fancy, very opulent tomes, right? Yes. As an end, I'm going to suggest printing gets industrialized. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you already had this in mind. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Uh, what, let's go into a little more detail. What does it look like when printing gets industrialized? Um, everybody in the world has access to the magical arts. Cool. I'm going to say everyone in the world has access to the magical arts, and uh, this makes whatever existing governments there were kind of untenable, right? Because there's not really scarcity anymore. Everyone's got magic. Yeah. Oh, it, you go on. Go for it. Oh, I, I have nothing else to say. This feels like a very uh, utopian, kind of upbeat microscope uh, scenario compared to anything that I've heard friends play or anything in the guidebook, but I absolutely love that. The next step is to come up with the, the palette for the story, right? And the idea here is we're going to go back and forth a couple times and describe things that we want to include or conversely want to ban. And we can each add a, either a thing that we definitely want to include or a thing we definitely want to ban. Mm -hmm. a, and then we can each do one or the other, right? So we each do the opposite of what we did the first time. Okay, you go first. Cool. Something I think I'd like to include in this history is a way to, you know, through the magic that is being transmitted uh, via writing now, uh, to communicate with fairies. I think that it would be cool if one of the things that is initially like a secret confined to this monastery that's going to spread throughout the world is a way to uh, communicate with fairies. Uh, what's something you definitely want to include or definitely want to ban? Um, ban or include. Uh, can we flesh out a little bit more of like what else is in this world? You tell me. Oh. Yeah. Mm. 
We have monasteries. We have fairies. We have fairies. We presumably have paper mills, ink refineries. Uh, we have some type of governmental bodies, which will yeah. be toppled. Eventually. I'm imagining Maybe. they're kind yeah. of feudal or something like that almost. This would be feudal. Um, well, the monasteries are going to be up in the mountains. And then are we where we have farmland cultivated down below sure i love there, this. there's gonna be luddites so there are gonna be people who explicitly do not want to use magic oh and awesome ban that, so awesome so you're gonna have something you're definitely going to include luddites luddites yeah i love this okay hmm i'm gonna think of something that i definitely want to not include in this world or not include in this story. I love your description of, you know, there's monasteries up in the mountains and then there's uh, kind of the, the common folk down on the plains doing a bunch of farming. One thing I'm maybe not going to allow in this story is a happy ending for the monasteries. I love this world that you created. I love the idea of the monks discovering this. I think that modernity and industrialization and the printing press are going to make those magical monks copying their manuscripts obsolete. So I'm going to ban a happy ending for the monks. What would you like to ban? Uh, I think what's... Should we flesh out the world a little bit more? And where on the timeline are we for... This is something that anywhere in the story will okay. not show up, guaranteed. Something that will not show up, guaranteed. Right. If you say frogs, at no point can we mention frogs, right? <laughs> this is something that you are saying, uh, I don't want this in the story, and that we're agreeing right now will definitely not be in it. Mm. Carrier pigeons? <laughs> Oh, so the idea is you don't have like fast communication via yeah. some pre magical means. Yes, something that's yes, what you said. I love that. Okay, okay. so you can't do a um, in Game of Thrones the TV show they have ravens, right? Right. And yeah. the idea here is no ravens. There's no ravens. Okay, yeah. So there's slow communication. And does that persist all the way through the industrial era? Hmm. Yes. Oh, I love this. Yeah. They never get... And this is something that, you know, as someone who runs a lot of tabletop games, <laughs> people have a hard time with a world where there's not... You can't call someone. You can't text yeah. someone. They're just unreachable. I really like the idea that this magic does not include fast communication. Yeah. That's, it's like, would that be the text is heavy or some type of... Ooh. <laughs> Ooh, I love that. Okay. So we have the written word, but it's not written in ink. It's got to be like on heavy ass stone tablets. Or I'm thinking <laughs> of the medium, the medium of communication. <laughs> so you don't want communication to become too fast. Yeah. I love that. Okay. Um, let's write those up on the whiteboard and then get on to building some periods in the history. All right, let's do it. Cool. So now we have the start and end of this history. We have uh, kind of a grand sweep we want to see. We have things we absolutely want to include and things we don't want to include. Uh, now we get the chance to create a period in this history. And so the idea here is this is a, um, uh, a sweep of time uh, over which we're going to, uh, you know, initially have this, this, this broad span of time and then drill down from there. Uh, periods show us, quote, the big picture and the broad sweep of history. So what is a period that we would have somewhere between those start and end dates? We're not really supposed to collaborate this much, uh, but unilaterally declaring periods is maybe bad radio. <laughs> <laughs> so... Declaring period. Um... Go for it. Declare a period. I'll just I'll, then I will declare a period after yeah. all. Cool. 
I'm going to combine uh, uh, fairies and Luddites because I think there's a relatively natural overlap there. <laughs> I'm going to have a period of time in which pretty much everyone is contacting the fairies to, you know, gain information about their neighbors or divine the location for wells or things like that. But everyone is outwardly pretending that, like, oh, heavens, no, I, I would never do that myself. You know, a period of, like, very, like, public hypocrisy, almost, uh, where everyone's gotten access to the fairies, and they're like, this is too useful not to use for various tasks. You know, these fairies will prevent the milk from spoiling. Um, but then outwardly, they're like, heavens, no, I don't, I don't need any of that magic. And I'm going to say that's quite a long period of time in this world. I have to describe whether the tone is light or dark. I'm going to say the tone of this is light um, uh, because I feel like that's just kind of a... Everyone's using this for something good. They're just kind of being silly about it publicly. They're being silly about it publicly. Okay. Yeah. Like everyone kind of knows that everyone else is contacting the fairies, right? But there's this this public taboo against saying that out loud. Okay. Do the, fairy, the fairies don't have magic or do they possess magic? <sighs> I'm going to say the fairies do do but they possess kind of small forms of magic you know keeping milk from spoiling and having gossip about your neighbors and things of that nature fairies can't um like create an earthquake or anything like that okay so it, it makes life around your farm easier and more enjoyable but also there's like a widespread taboo against doing it and so there's this long period where everyone knows everyone's doing it but no one owns up to it okay um after that period will be a Luddite fundamentalist movement. Okay. So... Is this an event within the period, or is this a separate period? Uh, this would be an event that ends that period, I would say. Excellent. Awesome. Tell <laughs> yeah. me about it. Okay. Um, that is where they, they move back to a strict no-magic uh, lifestyle. And, um, like explicitly outlaw communicating with the fairies and the monks and like starting to attack them i think starting to attack the monks or the fairies mm -hmm. they're interacting with the fairies so they get banned monks can't have a good ending yeah monks can't have a good ending in the long run so the government has said the luddites are right no townsfolk farmers you can't interact anymore with the fairies Okay. Is that that kind of what you have in mind? I think so, but like, and they, like, it becomes violent. Between whom? Between the Luddites and the fairies. Who wins? Uh, the Luddites are going to win. What happens to the fairies? Um, the fairies are banished or almost extinct. Hmm. Ooh. So the tone of this would be light or dark. This would be dark, right? I think this would be very dark. Yeah. So the Luddites win. Fascinating. Okay, let's write that up on the whiteboard and then think through some scenes that might happen in this period and this event. Okay. Cool. So uh, now we have a period, uh, this kind of era of hypocrisy, an event that ends it. Luddites kind of gain dominance. They Their attacks decimate the fairies. Uh, and we're going to start thinking about scenes within it. And in the world of Microscope, in this kind of uh, fractal, depth-first world building, uh, scenes are the smallest unit of history, right? right. And so this is um, specific place, specific time, specific people. And uh, there's almost going to be a little bit of role play going on here where we describe some characters within it. So we're going to have a question about something happening during that event where the Luddites kind of become dominant and lead attacks on the fairies. And, uh, you know, we're going to have a question uh, that is going to help us come to consensus on what a, and, and to role play what a scene within that event looked like. Do you have a question in mind? Hmm. I can also come up with one if you'd like. You, I would love it if you came up with one. Sure. What moved the needle and had the government actually start attacking the fairies? Where is this world going? 
It's going somewhere grim, thanks to the event you just proposed. Thanks to the event. Um... Oh, gosh. Like, what made the government actually tip over from this era of, we're all using fairy magic, but it's okay, to like, no, time to grab our... Uh, I don't know... F- I, I, it's too upsetting to think about what weapons this would be. Time to grab our pitchforks and uh, torches and and uh, sharpen shovels and go out there against the fairies. Like what? What well, happened? I mean, if do the fairies? Fairies are the source of magic mm-hmm. teaching. Um, the monks learn how to. Let's circle back. Let's get back to the monks. Sure. They, uh, learn how to interpret that and then teach that. And then there are Luddites who uh, get access to um, magical spells with on their tablets or whatever. Sure. And there's no, they don't have any context for it. And so it's, they don't know what the magic is. And when they just say the incantation, bad things may happen. And the government needs to tap down, tap, tamp down on, uh, rogue untrained people like using magic ah so the problem is that there's been an outcry (laughs) after people who didn't know what they're doing use magic for ill or yeah it could be ill it could just be there's magic in the world um by people who don't know what they're doing with it and are they using that magic in ways that cause crop failures are they putting like a curse on a bloodline to the seventh generation accidentally what kind of thing i guess what what is the inciting incident where when you show up at the royal court uh the nobles are going to be like Hmm. we're going for it uh someone could curse one of the nobles bloodlines oh i love it okay that sounds sounds like a good move in terms of okay let's talk through the scene a little bit more (laughs) Um, cool. So the scene is going to be, uh, is it going to be the actual cursing of the bloodline or is it going to be kind of the nobles talking about what happened? Uh, it's going to be, uh, a jester brings in a tablet for entertainment and that is what curses a bloodline of the nobles. I absolutely love this. Okay. Now that you're the player making this scene... Uh, you can specify one or two characters someone must play in the scene and one or two characters no one can play in the scene. Mm. So it sounds like the gesture is one of the characters someone must play in the scene. Yes. Do you have any other characters in mind that must be present? Uh, I mean, the king or a no a representative for the nobles i suppose the one who's going to get cursed the one who's going to get cursed cool given that there's two of us do you want to be the uh uh jester or the noble as kind of your main character uh i will be the noble oh let's hear your noble voice hello i am the noble of the land Oh boy, stay tuned for Campaign Spotlight Actual Play, where oh, Riley keeps that no. voice going for, <laughs> for 300 hours. Matt Mercer wishes. Um, cool, I guess I can be the jester. Um, and uh, are there any other minor characters that we also need to have? Uh, I guess, is this happening kind of in court in front of like the queen and everyone? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so the next thing we want to do is, uh, what is one thing that your character is um, thinking about the upcoming scene? Right. And uh, my character is going to be the Jester, whose name is Steve. And Steve the Jester is going to be thinking that um, this is his big break. He's going to be coming in here. He's got like a heavy stone tablet that he's about to read some incantations off of. And he's like, I'm getting, this is like a a gig with the royal court. You know, I'm, I'm finally making it in the world. This is kind of a big deal. Nothing can go badly for me right now. Uh, tell me a little bit about your noble. What, what's their name? And also, what are they thinking as the scene starts? 
Their name is Bennington Longstash. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, and they're thinking about how much power they're accruing. What was the question? So the question is, as this scene starts, so Bennington Longstash is unfortunately about to suffer a horrible bloodline curse to the seventh generation. Okay. Um, and uh, due to Steve misreading the tablet. And as the scene starts, what is something that uh, Bennington Longstash is thinking about that's relevant to this scene? Like, you are an important, rich person, maybe on the, on the rise, and you're, uh, you're at a jester show where the jester's going to summon some fairies and do some magic. Do some magic, yeah. I'm, uh, thinking, I, I'm thinking I've made it. <laughs> this is kind of tragic because they both kind of are thinking like oh this is it you know is it like at the royal court is that why you've made it like you're at the yeah, king and queen's this palace is my, this is my first time in the royal court this is your first time in the royal court this is this is a celebration uh for my like getting to be in the in group should it be like a betrothal or a wedding or some type of event like that i love that you're yeah. like a wedding yeah yes are, wait, are you getting married into the no into the royal family is that why you've made it uh yeah okay i absolutely love that and so um yeah uh so so we have we have a sense of what the scene is going to be in mind mm -hmm. and this is kind of horrible. I'm so used to playing games like this with dice that I'm frantically reaching around the table like, how are we going to make how, decisions? Yeah. <laughs> how do we make decisions? Um, we roleplay what our characters do and think. Okay. If uh, one of our characters, and we'll just play these two characters for the most part, with the other ones kind of popping in and out, and uh, at this big royal wedding, and... Um, uh, you know, if someone uh, tries to do something to your character, you get to describe the outcome for that. Uh, and you, you know, you kind of shape the world by describing what your character is perceiving, how they're reacting to it. And we can both pop in and play secondary characters like the monk who's marrying them or like, you know, the dowager queen or whoever we want as well. Um, and so, yeah. Um, I guess we can we can kind of get into it. Uh, hopefully, it, it makes sense what we're doing right now. Um, so I'm going to say that uh, Steve is walking in. It's maybe the let's say it's like the reception the night before the wedding. Okay. Right, and Steve is coming into this this banquet hall, and it it smells like roast meat and wine and kind of like you know luxurious delicacies. Um, and, uh, Steve is like, kind of like, oh, wow, this is it. This is my day. Um, I got this big stone tablet that I hauled down, uh, from, you know, the local monastery where the, uh, magic was etched into it. I'm going to read it out. Uh, you know, the fairies are going to summon a flock of doves. It's going to be beautiful. And this is really going to make a name for me as the preeminent jester for, um, for big royal events. And so, uh, you know, Steve is kind of about to come on to stage and has that, has that mindset. What right now is uh, Bennington Longstash <laughs> uh, thinking about uh, as the scene's about to open? Mm, well, I mean, like, I've made it. I'm about Who are you to, marrying? Who am I marrying? The hottest dude in the land. The hottest dude in the land who's also a royal or who's is just a, a hot dude? Oh, perfect. What are the odds? <laughs> This is like a Snow White situation where it just so happens that yeah. got it. Okay, great. Um, yeah, and and what I guess what are you doing at, at this the banquet? Uh, you know, the night before the wedding. What is your? Are you sitting with your betrothed? Is that too? Uh, you know, is that too informal for someone of your station? What? How, how should we think about what's going on there? Um. I'm the, the night before or during the recital? During this, the, the, this is the reception dinner. Reception. This is the banquet, yeah. The, the banquet. Um, I'm 
Well, I'm like at one end of a table making glances at like my betrothed from at the other end. At the other at end. The end. Yeah. Oh, this is a heartbreaking. <laughs> oh, you can't even be together. I like the instinct to be like, roll me a performance check right now is so strong <laughs> and I hate this about myself. Okay. Um, cool. So, uh, you know, Steve is going to come in, uh, um, uh, um, maybe be introduced by the MC presenting the one, the only, you know, all that kind of stuff and is, uh, is going to get up on stage and be a little bit nervous, maybe do a little bit too much patter, a little bit too much crowd work, you know, (laughs) and, uh, the show's not necessarily going as smoothly as it could. I'm going to say initially. And uh, I think some audience members are actually going to start being like, eh, well, I never, you know, and, and, and kind of being displeased with the state of how things are going. What is, um, and, and Steve is about to pull out the tablet, by the way, and summon the doves. What is Bennington Longstash thinking right now? <laughs> or doing or saying, are you hucking rotten fruit? Are you yelling, get off the stage? Um... Are you trying to sneak out? I'm enjoying my time. I'm You're drinking, enjoying it. Drinking wine. Okay. And just excited. Hell yeah. I love this concept. <laughs> All right. Steve's up there. Yeah, now for our for our grand finale. And is going to, um, you know, hold aloft the tablet. And I'm imagining, like, hold it well above his head and uh, read the ancient words on it. And uh, is, is really trying to summon just a flock of doves here into the banquet hall. Which, to start with, not like the most hygienic concept. Um, but, you know, it would be kind of this beautiful <laughs> spectacle. And, uh, and Steve is trying to provide a spectacle. Um, tell me a little bit about... Uh, what goes wrong, I guess? What what happens uh, instead of summoning the flock of doves that is going to end up generating this <laughs> curse of the seventh generation, curse of the seventh generation on your bloodline? My bloodline. Um, what happens is uh, all the royals, you need to wear royal accoutrement, like crowns yeah. and whatnot, to be royal. Of in course. This, in you, this world. You have to wear your crown all the time. Yes. Uh, the curse they have chin is, straps. So. The, the curse is my crown and my jewelry like can't just they fall off of my body and they are not able I'm not able to wear <laughs> you so you were <laughs> cursed so I was thinking the curse would be like horrible and like lamentable. You're cursed with the fact that your body repels crowns and other regalia? Yes. <laughs> The unthinkable curse through seven generations is that, like, crowns will just fall off your head. Yeah, how could you be royal without a crown? Your coronation's going to be a disaster. (laughs) Cool. Steve holds up the tablet, reads the spell. Um, I'm imagining lightning strikes you is what ends up happening. Ah. Yeah. Ah. (laughs) Yeah. And I can already see why the the monarchs are like, "Hey, wow, magic is dangerous." Our <laughs> our our dashing young son-in-law to be uh, is now cursed with an inability to wear crown. I guess they wouldn't find out until the big coronation yeah. ball. Oh no! Oh no! Once they've sunk this fortune into this feast, and there's been entertainers and there's been heralds throughout the land about about. Uh, Bennington Longstash, the new prince consort. And then at the coronation, the crown won't stay on. Oh my gosh. Okay. No, I can see where the pitchforks and torches are coming from. I think we're supposed to say at this point, we've answered the question. All right. Oh, I love this. Okay, cool. Um, That is kind of a sense of uh, how to drill down from the big picture to a period, to an event, uh, to a scene in, uh, in... um, in microscope, uh, this is uh, you know it's this indie RPG, right? It's very much not coming from a big publishing house, <laughs> very free form. Uh, it was developed like two thousand nine, two thousand ten, 
and then released in 2011. And that was an era when I think like indie games were really starting to thrive for a couple reasons. Uh, part of it was stuff like drive through RPG and sites like that, you know, mm-hmm. where you can just buy PDFs. And so suddenly you didn't have to have a big publishing house uh, to get uh, to get your, your game books out there, things like that. And so, you know, being an indie creator, you could actually just put out a cool new RPG. And, uh, you know, another part of it... I don't know how to say this, but this is the era when Dungeons and Dragons 4th edition was coming out. And it was not beloved. It was not thriving, right? The juggernaut of of Dungeons and Dragons that we we know now, it's kind of weird to think that there was an era where they released a version that didn't get traction. Um, But they did. (laughs) 4th edition, for a variety of reasons, maybe we'll get into in a future flashlight, was a bit of a flop. And so, uh, you know, that, that created an opening for other games and an opening for indie creators to try cool, new, innovative things where maybe you're using a lot of the same fantasy tropes and stuff as these classical role-playing games, but what you're trying to do here is build a grand sweep of history uh, rather than kind of play individual characters over time. And despite how much I want to roll dice right now, there, there, there are no dice involved. Um... And so, you know, the game book is written like a cookbook. It gives directions on, like, exactly what to do. It's easy to implement. I feel like we just did, you know... A... We did something, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we did. definitely went somewhere. We yeah. did. Yeah, no, it, it, it really does, uh, um, you know, put you in a state of... of it, it prompts you in a way to create an interesting world, or maybe not interesting. It prompts you to create a richly detailed world. Yeah. Um, it is terrifying not having chance tip the scales in any sort of way narratively. Um, yeah. it, it really is. Yeah. I, I feel like a lot of the time when I'm, you know, a GM and I, I am in pretty much every, every game I'm in, um, when I don't know what's going to happen next, it's so natural to just say, you know, give me some kind of ability check or even give me a luck check, roll a D20. Uh, and uh, the higher number, the better the outcome. Uh, in the current long-running campaign I have, my players are very interested in how well-seasoned their food is, and I just have them roll dice to determine that everywhere they go, how well-seasoned is the food here. And so having to talk things through without that pause, yeah. without that thumb on the scale, is really challenging. Right, and then there's no DM in this there's no DM yet. You know, the, the guidebook says it's okay if only one player has read the instructions before you start playing. But there's no one actually running the game. Terrifying. <laughs> Absolutely terrifying. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I feel like you definitely need um, players who are comfortable improvising with each other to play yeah. something like this. <laughs> I think you and I can go back and forth with this, but this is probably not a great game to play at, like, the comic book store with strangers. But, yeah, maybe. Maybe not. <laughs> um, and, and But I think also, you know, one use case for this, that uh, this is, what we're doing right now is not, despite the, the joke earlier about our actual play, uh, people use this kind of game to build their own settings, to, to build their own world to, to run a campaign in yeah. of, a, of a more classic kind of long form game. And, you know, after our conversation with Mike last week, where he talked about his world building process, which is not collaborative. <laughs> Uh, and uh, where you know the kind of the joy of being a player in that world is seeing the, the, these yeah. cool intricate settings that Mike has put together for you. Uh, I thought it was cool to think about what's a completely different approach. What could you do to have all your players, you know, sit down and collaboratively hash out what the campaign setting is going to be yeah. like? It'd be a great um, game zero, maybe. Just yeah, game, great like, session zero yeah, for sure. Session zero or session zero point five, like build characters, build a timeline jump into different like periods or scenes and then go into role play with dice yeah like, yeah like that could be a fun way to play a campaign you could almost imagine like the end of like the the sweep of the microscope history mm-hmm. being what just happened in the world that your, of your campaign and so there's this like richly detailed layered history in the past now mm-hmm. and you fleshed out the setting a whole lot and now it's the end and, you know, if we were going to make a game 
uh, in session 10, they'd come upon like the tombstone of like Bennington Longstash the eighth, you know, the first one who could wear a crown. Who and, could not wear a crown. Well, it's the eighth. So, you oh, know, it's the, eighth, the, the first one who could, who reversed the curse. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. And so they could have this, this sense of like, Hey, uh, you know, that little detail is something <laughs> from the, the inciting war between the fairies and, and the Royals. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't think we'll use this setting, but maybe we will. I actually kind of like it. It's definitely something. We for, might, yeah. We might have to inflict this on our friends at some point. Do a one shot in this world. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Well. <laughs> All right. Do we have anything else to talk about here? Yeah, I think we're gonna um, post. Uh, we'll post a link, of course, to Microscope and where you can All buy right. it in the show notes. Um, and, uh, I, you know, highly, highly encourage people try this out. Even if you're really used to rolling D twenties and getting the outcomes that way, it's a very fun, very different game. And, uh, quite frankly, you from playing a, a complete game of it once, you really do get your money's worth. So I think it's worth buying. Excellent. And that's going to be it for this week. I've been Jake behind the mic. I'm production master Riley. And not every natural 20 is an unqualified success. Do you run your own home game? Tell us about a cool homebrew item and we might feature it in an upcoming episode. Give us a call and tell us about it at 724-3-2020. Join us next week when we chat with Prim about letting your players take some narrative control. For more on the show, including links to all our social media, visit foldedfrequencies.com slash campaign spotlight.